um, this catastrophe movie we we are all in and uh, one wish you could say the news are getting better they're not really getting better in Europe is seems to have a little resurgence in Belgium and Switzerland and Luxembourg it's uh, coming uh, back up France is sending per mail masks to people who can't afford them or might not be able to buy them uh, Japan and Brazil Mexico are experiencing again uh, a resurgence and uh, and uh, so we, uh, we really do not know what is uh, coming up. Uh, it's becoming more and more clearer that, um, that infected people who have no symptoms might have spread the virus around. Um, it is airborne. Um, it was never so clear how could uh, so many people get infection if it was just really by, uh, by droplets and often protein had to be in it, but it becomes clearer and clearer that there are different ways this virus has been, uh, uh, been uh, transported and perhaps also mutated a little bit from different regions um, to others. California, where Hull Round uh, is based with Thea at the moment, also Betty, who is with us today. So first of all, hello, Betty. Hello. And uh, it now has more cases than New York, uh, the state of New York. So the big shift um, is taking place. Latin America has over 4 million cases. 2.2 million in Brazil alone, and the US has 3.9 million just alone. Of course, it's a very big country. Unemployment is uh, higher for the first time in the last months. It's last week. It, uh, uh, higher numbers instead of lower numbers, and uh, in unemployment help is running out. Uh, the uh, eviction moratorium is running out. Many landlords are preparing to throw people out. So it's a recipe for a disaster, a complete distrust for good reason in government. A heat in August, uh, people on the streets, civil unrest for very, very good reason and a distrust in workplace or perhaps seeing no future. So uh, it's a complicated, uh, complicated time um, we live in. Um, it is a time where we feel very strongly we have to listen to artists and we have done that for the last uh, four months here at the Siegel Center. Every day of the week we talk to uh, artists from New York, America, or mostly actually from around the world to hear what they have to say. And they are the ones who are close to the present, anticipate the future, as Monsieur says, the great philosopher who actually will be with us on Monday. And, um, and they have been on the right side on the fight for social justice and the complex history of freedom and liberties. And one of those great artists uh, who really in her life's work has contributed, make enormous contribution um, and is exploring what theater and playwriting can do is Betty Shamia. She is uh, with us here. So uh, Betty, welcome, welcome. And uh, before I read a bit from your bio, where are you right now and uh, what time is it? I am in the San Francisco Bay Area and it is about almost nine o'clock. So, oh, it's yeah. nine, nine a.m. Yeah. yeah, so we got you out uh, on an unholy time <laughs> for a theater person before nine o'clock. Yes, doesn't happen of, easy. But... Yeah, <laughs> um, the of fifteen plays, and that's a lot. And you learn something <laughs> when you write and produce fifteen plays. He's a Mellon Foundation player in residence at the Classical Theater of Harlem, and her work includes, of course, Roar, which is perhaps one that is the most popular, most well-known, and it's being presented at so many colleges and cities, uh, it's translated in seven languages, um, but other works, and often interesting ones, there's other ones that are not as well-known, but other ones are the Black-Eyed, Fit for a Queen, and uh, The Strangest, and, and many, many others. She actually also starred in her own series of monologue that was called The Chocolate in Heat, Growing Up Arab in America, which gives you an idea of what we might be uh, talking about. Mm -hmm. And it had a, a long run um, in off, off Broadway here in New York and, and went also around the country. She was named UNESCO Young Artist for Intercultural Dialogue. Uh, she's a Harvard Clifton visiting artist. And uh, she's currently developing a new comedy, uh, Malvolio, a sequel mm -hmm. to Last Night. And, um, and first of all, Betty, thank you for taking the time. I apologize for talking so much. Uh, it's all, as we say, what? all the thing. And then I <laughs> great, friend. Frank, uh, Frank Henschke from the Siegel Center. So Betty, how are you? What's going on? How come you're in San Francisco and not in New York? Well, I, I've always considered myself bi-coastal. My family is based in the San Francisco Bay Area and I am, you know, very family oriented. So I spent, though I, 
uh, New York is my artistic home. Um, my familial home where I have a huge Palestinian family is actually in the San Francisco Bay area. And um, me and my husband and my child had been bouncing around for the past few years and we decided to sublet our place in New York and come to San Francisco and kind of quarantine with multiple generations in one house, um, which has been interesting and uh, <laughs> is very, you know, I I think there's two sides to uh, artists like myself who are very community minded, but also artists who require significant amount of time alone to create and um, thrive. Uh, so it's it's been very interesting that, you know, when the apocalypse hit, I chose to, you know, kind of ground down with multiple generations of my family um, in one house. And so um, it just kind of shows, I feel I bounce between that kind of, you know, really being centralized in a community or in the family and also being an artist who needs to write and create, you know, alone, which I think writing is one of the most lonely, um, lonely, not in, in a bad way, but requires uh, a sense of, uh, separation. And so it's been very, very uh, challenging, but also wonderful to kind of, uh, you know, deal with what's going on. Um, one thing that I always bring with me is, is these two lions that I bought from the New York Public Library, where I wrote for years, um, you know, the main branch uh, on 42nd Street. And the lions are named Patience and Fortitude. And most people don't know they were uh, initially called Lord Astor and um, Lady Lennox. And they were named mm -hmm. after these very wealthy funders. Mm -hmm. But the mayor of New York during the Great Depression thought it was unseemly to be uh, naming these iconic uh, New York figures after rich people. So he changed it to patience and fortitude. And so I kind of carry these bookmarks around with me and they're, um, I spent a, a good part of uh, my career after Roar in uh, Europe. Uh, doing work about Palestinians and Arab Americans that I, I did, was not able to find homes for as easily in the U.S. Uh, and I would carry these lines with me, which is quite a thing. Um, and, you know, in the first days of the quarantine, uh, patience broke. And so I was left with fortitude. So it, it slipped out of my hand and cracked. And so I created this series at the Classical Theater of Harlem called The Chronicles of Fortitude, where I interview artists, very similar to what you're doing here, Frank. But mm -hmm. my main question is, what was the hardest period of your artistic life or personal life? And how did you develop the skills in which to uh, push through that period? Because I needed those answers from the artists that I admired and I needed to connect with them here. And you know, being in resonance at a place like Classical Theater of Harlem gave me kind of a platform to reach out to amazing people and say, can you talk to me about how you got through of uh, things and, and what does fortitude mean, uh, you know, uh, when you're without patience. Um, so one of the things that I've really extrapolated from just talking to different people in this interview series that I'm doing is that, you know, we've got to make, uh, somebody said, uh, it's actually Chris Wells who does The Secret City, who I listen to, um, he does, a, uh, he does a, a similar kind of podcast, but he said, you know, the first part of compassion is compass. And if you use it as a compass, you, you know, make compass your compassion, you can kind of extend compassion to people who, who disagree with you or belittle you or dehumanize you. And, and what does that mean to be operating? And one of the things that I'm trying to make, you know, uh, compassion, my compass is to make to be compassionate to myself as an artist, because there's so much that I want to say and do and express and, and just being compassionate with the fact that I am stuck in a home, you know, and I'm homeschooling, I'm outside of New York. Uh, even if I were in New York, I wouldn't be able to, uh, you know, really begin the residency that I started at Classical Theater of Harlem earlier this year. This is, I have three years that the Mellon Foundation gave me to kind of be working with them and be part of their um, kind of ethos as an institution. And the fact that I'm doing it from afar, um, I had to kind of create things that made sense to me. We're, we're doing this amazing project at the Classical Theater of Harlem that's um, being curated by Sean Ren Renee Graham and myself, uh, which is 
called the Icons Project, in which we're commissioning uh, writers at different stages of their development, um, some very experienced, some new students, to write about lesser known figures of the, class, of the, uh, the Harlem Renaissance and to kind of uplift on the 100 year anniversary what this, what this community meant. I mean, uh, Harlem is the only place in North America known for creating renaissances. So it's, it's a, the fact that we're approaching its 100 year anniversary in the middle of so much social unrest um, felt like an important time to kind of locate and talk about the artists and figures, unlike you know Langston Hughes, that we whose names we may not know, um, and that's been really really wonderful. So we're we're going to, you know, we're we're waiting to see if we can. Um, classical theater problem does this amazing thing where they do, uh, you know, a classical or a classical inspired work uptown, um, and uh, in the park, and the and it's really you know kind of devastating to me that the first year that I'm in residence they're not doing it so we're trying to see if there's an opportunity for us to uh to maybe perform in the park uh but it felt like uplifting the voices of the Harlem Renaissance of people who went through a period of social unrest and flourished and created during and after it uh felt like an important kind of project to be working on um and uh, so those are the things that I, so I, I, when the pandemic hit, I, I did what I normally do, which was work really hard. I got really busy. You know, I started interviewing amazing people. I started, you know, commissioning these young writers and selecting them and, you know, guiding them. And I started teaching, uh, you know, uh, because everybody went online, a bunch of my professor friends called me up and said, can you teach a solo writing class? Can you teach a playwriting class because as they were getting you know used to the format so I did a lot of work um mm. and now I'm feeling like you know using <laughs> compassion as my compass I'm using this time to also kind of settle down and reflect because we don't know how long this is going to be and you know one as an artist must kind of think of of their life as a marathon and not a sprint and I tend to sprint while I'm <laughs> running a marathon and, and didn't, you know, and not take the time that I need. And this is forcing me to be more reflective. It's forcing me to, you know, homeschool my six-year-old son. Um, and that's, you know, I think parenting and artistry is, is almost diametrically at odds because you, you're teaching someone how to learn, but as an artist, you're always learning yourself. So you're always balancing your own needs as an artist to continue growing and learning and thinking and creating with helping somebody get the tools to be able to do those things. And so during the pandemic, that's very much at head for the artist parents that I know um, uh, who are kind of grappling with the needs of others versus the needs of oneself when you don't have the outlets of, you know, let me hire somebody to play with my kid while I write or let me um, you know, run to a museum and get really inspired and be alone for a few hours. So um, uh, yeah, so that's very uh, important. There's a lot of stuff going on, family stuff going on outside, but <laughs> we'll try to ignore that. Um, uh, yeah, so I, that's where I'm at. Uh, yes. Yeah. My family's apparently um, uh, walking around outside. I'm in a little like, out, yeah, <laughs> they walk, which is distracting, which is, you yeah. know, their right to do, but just distracting <laughs> in your live streaming. So. <laughs> um, but that kind of is indicative of, you know, I, I'll, I'll be thinking a very clear, precise thought, and then, you know, someone walks yeah. by and you're like, oh, there it went. Um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so where were you when you had to make up your mind where to go for this time of? We actually where were, we you know, we had sublet our place in New York and we were living in Miami. Um, and so it kind of just made sense to, to uh, keep subletting. And, um, and my actual residency at Classical Theater of Harlem hadn't officially started. So, uh, and it looks like most of it's going to be online anyway. So it, it made sense to kind of work within, um, uh, uh, work within uh, 
the framework of having family help, you know, so. Mm, so yeah. it brought the family uh, back together. So you're based in Brooklyn, I guess. Uh, no, oh, I, I kind of, I really do see myself as bi-coastal, but I am, uh, are, I'm in the East Village. Oh, you're in the East Village, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, <clears throat> so uh, living with your family, um, it might be a <laughs> lion's raw, as your play was. Uh, so <laughs> yes, is it, uh, absolutely. How was that experience? Tell us a little bit to live together with multiple generations. As an artist and, uh, <laughs> Do you want do you want the real version or do you yes, want the how is it uh, it's I think the homeschooling is the thing that's the the you know the the suddenly having to be the social and emotional learning as well as academic learning for a child that is you know is really knocking the breath out of me but it's also a chance to really to be here and to be doing the thing that I really desperately wanted. I very much wanted to be a parent. Um, that, was some, that was an experience that I um, deeply, deeply wanted to experience. And, uh, you know, and so I, I, you know, I think I will look back, hopefully, if we all survive this, uh, as, as a time that was where I discovered a lot about myself um, as, as, as a person you know, connected to an older and uh, a younger generation and kind of, you know, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I have a lot of friends who chose not to have children. And I always say, you know, if it's not something you're absolutely sure about, don't do it because it's, it's, you know, it has to be something you entirely wanted. And I did. So, um, someone said so, you can as well get a tattoo in your face. It's the same commitment. <laughs> it is. It is absolutely. Um, uh, and so, and, you know, I, I did it with the expectation that, you know, the, the kid would go to school too. So, that's, you know, like, uh, so, you know, so what did you discover? Yeah, uh -huh. you said you, you discover, what did you discover as a writer, or as an artist in that world in this time of Corona? What, what surprised you? What is it? What did you, what did you? Uh, well, I, what, what surprised me is the need to pace oneself and the need to have like I said, compassion, real compassion for, um, you know, I am too tired to write. I have, I'm spent. I have, you know, I'm somebody who's, who's kind of on high speed all the time. And I think that comes from being a Palestinian American and Arab woman, but I feel the, a very strong need to create and speak and write and take up space in a, where where women like me and our stories are seen in glimpses, if at all. So that is often like being a parent and an artist at odds with with you know the need to rest and recover and process. You know, like I begin my next play in the middle of a world premiere of my last one because the idea of not being working on something is is terrifying to me. So. Uh, the pandemic has forced me to slow down. You know, like I said, the first thing I did was like, let me start an interview series. Let me, um, you know, let me create this Harlem icons project. Let me do things. Let me, you know, do the 24 hour viral plays. Let me. And so I feel like, you know, any disruption is a, is an opportunity to grow. Um, and growth is always challenging. So this has really been an opportunity for me to see, See, you know, the other thing is I have really taken a turn in my work where I really just want to be writing comedies, dark comedies, um, generally, because that's my bent, but I really want to make people laugh and have that opportunity to do that. And because I write about women and Arabs and Palestinians and Arab Americans, uh, you know, I'm not really known for my comic bent. And I one of the things that's really exciting for me about being at the Classical Theater of Harlem is I don't feel like when I'm at an institution that's for uh, and by people of color that um, uh, that I have, you know, I walk in with and people have expectations of what a play about it by an Arab American woman is going to sound like and what's the theme and what's the subject matter. And, and you know, I right now want to write comedy. I mean, the first thing and that generally happens. I mean, after the Great Depression, you know, all Hollywood was making was comedy. 
Um, and I think that that's going to be something that comes out of, you know, any disruption. Our lives are so unsettling and uncertain and difficult right now. And uh, the ability to make people laugh is is uh, something that I'm really eager to to get back to live theater. You know, I'm, I, you know, I'm. I want to say something about live theater, and live theater is like music. And some of the earliest theatrical experiences I had was in Daly City, where I grew up um, until I was a teenager going to like the public library and getting, you know what I mean? Those Sony disc players of Broadway plays, not even musicals and listening to them. So what I'm urging people who are like sick of live streaming of theater is to think of it like music, listen to it. Don't sit there and watch flat actors and compare it to Hollywood and think that that's going to be, you know what I mean? Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, think of it like an opportunity to listen because that's, I mean, I. I heard a, a, I think it was a, you know, Broadway production of the Duchess, the Duchess of Malfi, that still to this day, those actors' voices have stayed with me, and and so I feel like if we stop staring at our screens and start listening to plays again, um, it, it's a much more fruitful experience, you know, and and the idea that you have to be moneyed and connected and uh, you know exposed enough as a child to attend Broadway shows or that we need opening night parties to experience theater is something that hasn't been true to my experience. That artists find ways to learn and grow and listen. And so, you know, Classical Theater of Harlem has a, a number of plays that they're streaming that are wonderful to be heard. You know, and the visuals are amazing too for, you know, the limitations of you know, something that was not meant to be filmed. But I really encourage people to think about plays as music and to listen to the music of the plays, you know, in the way that you would listen to a radio play. Because there's, that is, you know, the, I think the way we can experience live theater or performance um, more successfully, you know, so. Mm. Mm. So, so do you, were you able then to write? To, are you working on a play now? Or? Yes, absolutely. I am laughing my, my, you know, you know what off at, you know, I really am very excited about my play, uh, Malvolio, which is a sequel to Twelfth Night. Because again, um, I first experienced Shakespeare on the page. I was not exposed to, uh, to theater until I was much older. And I, and, you know, one of my teachers taught us Twelfth Night. And I, there's this character that is always cast as a, you know, an old bletch or, you know, a Puritan. And in my mind, he was a young servant and he's sexually humiliated in, in the Shakespeare original um, in a way that is really cruel and mean. And I always thought the reason that they did that is because he was a servant. And there is a lot of classism in, in plays, uh, you know, by Shakespeare who was incredibly savvy Shakespeare was incredibly savvy about um, kind of endearing himself to the, to, um, you know, the royals and the ruling regime and the people who funded, you know, the Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth and James after her. And, you know, I, most people don't know that uh, King James was really into, I, I, I hope it's King James, it's one of the kings, it wasn't Queen Elizabeth, mm -hmm. was really into witches. And so he crafted Macbeth and he, uh, the king even wrote a, like a, a treatise on witchcrafts and thought that he had powers. So he crafted Macbeth in kind of homage to the things that was interesting to the king, you know what I mean? And even Banquo in Macbeth. Um, so he created witches, which, you know, wasn't See, traditionally he done. Used of, he used real magic, like real magic words. You know, that's yeah, yeah, exactly, wonderful. exactly. So he, so he was kind of a kiss up. <laughs> like, and so when I think about what's happening in American theater and how, uh, you know, uh, artists of color have been made to feel to kind of have to kowtow to uh, the people who have money and power and influence the tastemakers, you know, it, uh, playwrights have been doing that since <laughs> Shakespeare, you know, like, and how do we kind of change the dynamic and the, you know, one of the things for me that's very important 
you know, I feel like when I go in and try to, you know, pitch a play, everybody wants to play about sad refugees, you know, because people want to feel like, oh, they did their duty and, you know, and they also see, you know, Arabs and Arab Americans as either victims or perpetrators of violence. So they don't humanize them. And if you're a victim or a perpetrator of violence, you were only seen in relation to how you affect us and us as in the, the white theater going audience. So, you know, when I come in with plays about, you know, Egyptian queens who become pharaohs or <laughs> a, a sequel to Shakespeare's Twelfth Night, you know, I, I have a really hard time pitching it. And so mm -hmm. being at a place like Classical Theater of Harlem that is engaging first in classical themes, you know, I think one of the things that I feel that's, a problematic about American theater is we're reactive in that, um, you know, what does well on Netflix isn't going to do well in the next generation of theater makers. I think we have to be what we are. We have to be, you know, the nerdy intellectuals that we are. And even if our industry is going to become more like opera, more rarefied, I think that we lose more by expecting if you are watching a play that you can see on Netflix or Hulu uh, just as easily, you're not going to go pay money to watch those kinds of plays. So we have to become more of what we are. We have to become more experimental in terms of form and content and, and more exciting for the people who actually love theater because trying to hold on to that audience, you know, as if we're in the era of Arthur Miller, where there's like a Broadway show and a few TV shows and how you go to hear real stories is, is the theater is not where we are culturally anymore. So I feel like, you know, uh, part of the reason why I was probably done in Europe more is I write big ambitious plays. You know, I'm the, the writers who excite me are Janae. I love Tennessee Williams and I love Arthur Miller, but you know, Janae's kind of wildness um, you know, the, the blacks, the maids, that's, that's where I think American theater is going to go if we're going to survive, you know, and be still remain a, a, a really important cultural force. We need to, you know, kind of embrace that we are a theatrical form and, and we have to do things only theater can do if we're going to have an audience, it, you know, so that's something that, uh, and again, being at an institution that supports, that has classical in the title, that takes, you know, uh, writers and says, what do you want to create? How do you want to engage with the canon? How do you want to become part of a canon? Um, uh, is, is really, really, I think, the future of American theater. Mm -hmm. No, no, I think it is a, a, an important concept that existing institutions, existing structures, invite people in to create instead of saying you know we have a play you can audition to be the director or the actor <laughs> and do it this kind of karaoke model of um of a theater and if it's done well it also has something to it and but most of the time it's not as good as the original but the idea to uh, open an institution be outside be in the parks and uh, and uh, and say yeah as you say what you write could be a classic too you know so aurora is a classic now and um so what are those lines In the very beginning of the history of the of the moma museum of modern art there were concepts no piece should be older than five years inside wow. the museum because then it's no longer you know a modern it's already oh it's a classic piece or not you know so yeah uh, it's completely different from of course where it ended up um, so, um, so tell us a bit, you mentioned it, uh, the experience in the American theater. What do you think of American theater? Well, how did you experience it? <laughs> well, um, you know, I, I was very rewarded by American theater when I, uh, you know, you know, wrote traditional family dramas about Arab Americans that were not exceedingly politically, uh, explosive. <laughs> So, you know, I, I got out, you know, uh, Chocolate and Heat and Roar, you know, I love those plays. They're my early works. Um, but I felt like as a minority, you're put in, in you know, and I, and I know that many other writers feel that way. You know, I wanted to write really interesting stories about Arab Americans that were, that complicated the, 
the picture of, you know, Arab women as, you know, for example, I wrote a play fit for a queen about a female pharaoh who ruled ancient Egypt, which was a superpower of the world, the ancient world, for 20 years. And nobody knows her name. Her name's Hepjetsit. Um, and to me, that was crazy that you could know Cleopatra and you could know Elizabeth, but you didn't know about a woman who ruled the superpower of the ancient world for 20 years. And I was super excited about that. And nobody was, nobody was. They'd like, you know, you'd see people's eyes glaze over. And, you know, and also what was challenging about that play was, and what was amazing that CCH did it in the middle of the election period was she was complicated. And the point of the play was that power corrupts. It wasn't that women are wonderful and uh, thank God we have a couple of prime ministers in Europe because they're going to save the world because they're women. Because that has not been my experience of women. Um, and, uh, and I think it dehumanizes us and belittles us to say, oh, we're inherently nicer and inherently more, uh, you know, we're empathetic to people. That has not been my experience. Um, and, you know, I'm not saying it to put down women, I'm saying it to humanize us. And so I felt like what was also hilarious is, is people who really dug the idea of, you know, telling a story about an ancient African woman who, who ruled the superpower in drag. She, and what was so cool about her was she um, didn't say like Queen Elizabeth, I'm a queen, but I'm taking the place of a king. She said, call me king, I am Pharaoh, and she dressed like a man. I mean, that is just incredible to me. She ruled it for 20 years. She wasn't like a couple of years until she had a son. Uh-uh. She was, you know, balls to the wall. Amazing. And so when people, okay, nobody was interested in that. It felt like they wanted, you know, uh, you know, there's Syrian refugees. Don't want you, you want to write about that? I, absolutely. You know what I mean? Like r refugee life and story was clearly a part of my very early work and, you know, part of every Palestinian story. But I, I also wanted to do other things. So when I would go to theaters, they weren't really super excited about that. So I got that. But some people who were excited were excited about it because they wanted a narrative about how women empowerment meant better things for a country, which was, you know, it's a, it's a tragic comedy and it's a farce and there's a lot of violence in it. And, you know, there's a lot of sexual violence, women forcing men to have sex with them. So it, you know, it just was not what the narrative of even what I felt like the, the master narrative of what feminism wanted to project. So, so I wasn't getting the kind of lift that you'd get as a woman when you start saying things like, oh, we're, you know what I mean? We are, uh, you know, I feel that, that part of what is our shared humanity is we all have to curb our own appetites when we are in power or have them curbed for us. And that was the point of it. And I felt like, you know, when people were in the run-up of the election, they, they didn't really want to hear that story or didn't get that what I was doing with the story was showing how men and women are human, operate the same, and they need to be in check because people who have no checks on their power, uh, you know, all of us, myself included, uh, become problematic. So I felt that that but, and that's, you know, why I am so thankful that I did find uh, Classical Theater of Harlem and they said yes to producing that play. And it was a hard, you know, like, like everything that could have gone wrong, went wrong. We lost the star director, uh, Coleman Domingo, who had brought the play to Ty, to Ty and said, you know, we should work on this because he had uh, scheduling conflicts. So that was terrible. We tried to get a, a downtown theater to co-sponsor, which had, they had done with other CTH projects. That fell through. We Then we lost our space. Like everything possible that could have gone wrong with that production went wrong, like everything. And, and I was used to the experience of a theater waiting for three or four years for the right director to say yes, or you know putting a project on a shelf if they couldn't find a co-producer, so I was expecting Classical Theater of Harlem to tr basically treat me as an artist, uh, like how I was usually treated, not at every institution. And if you look at my resume, not at the institutions that I worked at. This is not, you know, this is to, you know, these are the people who did not treat me that way and did actually produce me. Um, and I just need to acknowledge, you know, the new group in New York Theater Workshop and the Magic who really did get behind my work. But that was my experience. 
of, of being like, everything has to fall in place in order for you to be produced. And everything you say in the play, we have to be able to get behind in a kind of like feminism, women good, men bad, you know what I mean? Like, and, and, but they still soldiered on with their limited resources and did the play because they felt it was important. And that was not an experience that was um, usual for me. It was usually like, if everything works out, you know, um, then maybe, but you know what's, now that I'm thinking about it, uh, it, it was, you know, and I'm thinking about the places that did support me, you know, those theaters that I mentioned, uh, it wasn't that way at those theaters, but it, it was my experience of trying to get things up in American theater. So it, I felt like it had to be a simplistic story, particularly if it was about an Arab American or, an, uh, or a perspective that was not traditional or white. It, um, it had to like uh, reinforce the master narrative of, you know, a woman in power, no matter what kind of woman she is, is better than no woman in power. Um, uh, which, I, you know, I always want to see myself reflected in positions of power. I want, you know, children to see that, um, you know, and but to not have a complicated narrative about humanity, you know, or to feel that that was somehow you know what I mean? Uh, not the story you needed to be telling right up at the run-up of election time. Uh, it seems so simplistic to me. So, um, so one of the things I did, I wrote an article, you know, that was kind of my response to, you know, we see you, white American theater, which was, I know that there will be people who will be targeted um, as troublemakers in American theater, and I hope that they're able to do what I did, which was find an institution that really, or create uh, an institution that really gets behind the work that they want to do. Um, and, you know, and, and to really look for, because I feel like one of the things I'm noticing, you know, as these kind of talks come up is, is, is I would love for, you know, the white allies to be able to have room to engage. And, and I, I feel like that will hopefully come soon. And, you know, because there have been a, a lot of people in my life who have, you know, made me the artist I am by, by supporting me and stepping up and not all of them are people of color. And I would like for the next phase after this phase, you know, because what I'm concerned with is there's all this flurry and all this action while no theaters are operating. And I just would hate for it to be business as usual in the year or so that things open up. So. I would just love for us to think about because nobody got into theater hoping, you know what I mean, to <laughs> to silence voices or 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 uh, you know trample on people's rights. I firmly believe that you know it's a hard industry to be in, and we are all doing our best. And sometimes our best isn't good enough. And how do we get better? Is a very important. Uh, is, a, is an important thing to be said as we're moving towards, because, you know, I just hate that the fact that we're all shuttered in our homes and our theaters are closed and we're having these conversations. I would hate for there to be no impact to these conversations and no kind of um, bridging of ways for people who are like-minded and, and, and trying to engage to do so, so. Mm -hmm. So the letter was about uh, saying, use what we have in a responsible way. Tell us a bit more what you wrote. Um, it said, you know, the title was it, we've seen white American theater. How mm. can we uh, black indigenous people of color now see ourselves? And it kind of talked about my journey of, you know, writing the kinds of plays that get rewarded in American theater, which are like family dramas that are not too political and how mm. I was not able to break out beyond that. And when I did, it was kind of like I stopped being, uh, having the same uh, opportunities to have my work produced and seen and how I had to go to Europe to get them done and how I eventually finally found a home in the classical theater of Harlem that where I felt like I could, you know, write a sequel to Twelfth Night and, and people wouldn't look at me sideways and be like, uh, don't you have anything about Syrian refugees? Which is like, mm. um, you know, it, which is an important story to be told, but it, and, but it's not the only story to be told. And it's not the only story I certainly can offer. And, um, 
and you know I so I, I it was just kind of a letter to a acknowledge um, that the black experience um, in American theater that they bear the brunt of microaggressions in artistic spaces, just like they bear the brunt of, you know, racist violence on the streets. Um, so to acknowledge that we don't all have the same experience, which is something that is, is a, a conversation that's happening within the people of color community. You know, it, it, you, we don't all experience microaggressions in the same way um, as people of color. And that's an important conversation to acknowledge and have but also to affirm that, you know, the, what I thought, uh, how you become a successful playwright of color was not the path I ultimately took. And how I kind of pivoted was by realizing that you never know where you're gonna get your biggest opportunity. And so if, you know, the, the aftermath and what I do think it will be the aftermath is what happens is, is the people who become associated with the movement become targeted and isolated. And um, for being at the forefront or speaking the most forcefully. And so it was kind of a letter to the, those people who are in the position of being pioneers that, that you can still create and find homes. Um, and that also the, you know, we talk a lot about the resources in American theater um, that are, you know, funding. And that was something I spent a lot of time early in my career. Because you know most theater companies have something about we are, believe in you know diversity. Now, if you go to a museum and it says we believe in diversity, and there's one or two pictures or paintings by a person of color, you would be like, that's crazy. But I think American theater has gotten away with taking the language of you know inclusivity in order to get funding without really truly being what they say they are. Like I think if you want to make theater about pink elephants, that's cool. You make whatever kind of theater you want. But to take the lion's share of funding, saying you're doing diverse works and to, uh, to you know, do one black play a year, or, and usually it feels so tokenism, you know what I mean? Like, like I, I'm so excited about the other voices in the Middle Eastern community. You will never see a season of me and another Middle Eastern uh, person in the same season. You will not see it. You will probably not see it within the same three years because the idea is there's, there can be only one person from that community and they can only tell one kind of story and then we're done and we've mm -hmm. you know, fulfilled our quota So uh, for our funding. So I spent a lot of time focusing on the funding you know, as a resource. How are these resources being used? And then when I kind of you know, spent a lot of time in Europe and kind of got my my sea legs as an artist and said this is the kind of work that I can do and want to do and it's comedy and it's big and it's expensive and do it um and if not I'll find a home elsewhere that will um uh so once I kind of got grounded in that place I realized that 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 I am not in the position of going and offer asking for resources I have a resource and I have an audience base and I have people who will come and see my work and I take that with me. So it's not a matter of please do my work. It's let me use the resources that I have and take them to the places that empower me as opposed to always be in the position of saying, you have this grant. I know you need to do a Middle Eastern person at some point in a post 9-11 era, please make it me. Um, so, uh, so just pivoting and saying, we have resources. We have incredible artists, probably the artists that define this era will be people of color. Um, at, or I like to think, because I am a person of color, maybe it won't be, but that's what I like to say. So we have an incredible resource, which is the art that we make. And we don't need to always be going to these institutions or going to the funders and saying, don't fund these institutions. We need to be taking those resources and those audiences and that excitement and enthusiasm for the work that we're creating to the places that make us feel seen and we're actually created to make, you know what I mean? Like classical theater of Harlem is the natural place to tell a story about a woman who ruled the superpower of Africa, you know what I mean, uh, for 20 years. That's a natural fit. Mm -hmm. and, and so rather than trying to change institutions, why don't we go where and take our incredible resources as artists and our, the incredible excitement we have when we create work 
to the places that where the audiences are. Um, so, and that's, you know, and, and also continue to hope that the institutions and the tastemakers, you know, uh, really live up to their mission statements. That's important too, but that's not the only thing we can do. Mm. <laughs> so that's, yeah. that's it in a, in a big nutshell. <laughs> yeah. You're right. You're absolutely yeah. right. Uh -huh. um, as far as I know, the majority of people living in New York City is a 10 million, 11, and nobody knows exactly, but they are no longer white. It is, uh, I see the minority, but you do not see it reflected on the stages. Uh, you don't hear the voices on the street. You don't always see that. I mean, of course, there are lots of exceptions, but it's not, as you say, not, not a rule. And often that one play that's supposed to be the diversity uh, token play, then the people in charge decide what scene, you know, it should be. And I remember once we had a black playwright, and she came to the Siegel and we talked about her work and she said, you know, I got that big uh, um, award to develop a play in the downtown theater. And uh, I said, oh, I like Joyce. I want to do something about James Joyce. And she said, people freaked out. People uh, said, what do you mean? That's not why we gave you this thought. You have to have show us the problems of the world, of your community and uh, the struggle and the suffering. and." And yeah, as you said, my, my joke I have always is that like in the medieval times, you know, when you had to pay for your sins and then you were taken away. Now often exactly. if you see a bad play, it's very expensive. If you don't enjoy it, you feel bad, but you paid for it and you did something, you know? So, but it's not uh, re representing life, the complexity of life, as you said. No. The, uh, the, the, the the multiple layers of what, what uh, it is all about and, um, and um, so your work for sure is uh, trying to do that. I also, if I remember right, even in the Arab American community were upset with the place that you thought were also successful, the family drama, but they said, how can you show us uh, this way, right? And, uh, and uh, <laughs> well, is that, do I have to get that right? Uh, no, I, I, I'm always challenging my community. I'm always, you know, aspiring for us to be more cohesive and do better yeah. and create actual institution buildings. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, but that, but everyone's, like I said, doing the best that they can and, uh, you know, heaven bless them for it. But uh, uh, what I will say is, um, you know, it's a very cynical thing. Someone, uh, a black writer once told me, and, you know, I don't know if I a hundred percent believe it, but sometimes it feels to me true in that way that you kind of pay for your sins by going and seeing a play. Um, somebody told me, and like I said, I don't espouse it, but it's something I think about. Like in that spirit of, cause it's certainly been the thing that you don't wanna see. I mean, nobody's asking me to write a play about a Harvard and Yale educated Arab playwright, which is my experience. You know what I mean? Yeah. They wanna play about, you know, I, I firmly believe if I wrote an honor killing play, you know, that would go to Broadway. You know, the idea of if I reinforced, which I, I constitutionally, I was actually commissioned to write an honor killing play and I constitutionally was unable to do it. I wrote a play and then the, the father shoots her at the end. And, and um, Ian Morgan, who was somebody I trust very deeply said, Betty, this makes no sense. This father would never kill this daughter. And I was like, I know, but I was commissioned by this university to write this honor killing play. And he said, you know, you need to let that go because you're, I, I am unconstitutionally unable to write that play because it is not my experience of Arab culture. And it feels like I am pandering and making white feminists feel better about their position rather than seeing the need for women's rights to be on a spectrum and that, that to otherize one person's experience. You know, uh, there's a, you know, law of what, crime of passion. So if you shoot your wife in bed with a man, you get off a little bit easier than if you just shoot her, right? So things like this exist in Western culture where it's the idea of policing women's sexuality exists. And I wanna talk about that. I don't wanna go and make people feel better about their lives because you know, one time in Jordan, one crazy father went off and shot his daughter. Or, you know what I mean? Like, I, I, like that doesn't, that isn't my experience. But this, you know, black writer told me and it, and it, and I, and I don't, you know, and I, I don't mean to put down what has been produced or anything, but he said, Betty, people like to have their stereotypes confirmed. 
So if I have a stereotype that black writers or Arab writers are less intellectual, less interesting, less human, less artistic, I would rather go see a play that is less interesting, less intellectual, because it confirms my worldview rather than a really complicated, intellectual, exciting work, because then I have to change my mind. Then I'm not paying the penance of going and seeing this play about this sad person that is unlike me, that to actually make a complicated picture is actually harder on the brain. And so when you see plays by a lot of the black and a lot of the Arab uh, writers that do get done, it tends to be less interesting, less complex, less intellectual, because that's easier on a white audience than blowing their mind with saying, oh my God, you know what I mean? There's this black woman and maybe, maybe she is the most intelligent person alive about James Joyce. Maybe there is nobody more interesting than her. And maybe when you see a black woman on the street, you need to incorporate that into your worldview. You know, like, and it's easier to be like, no, James Joyce is not for you. And I know what you are and, and you're not that interesting. So, so, so he says that, that, that white institutions would rather do a less interesting artist, a less intellectual artist and give their, their, their theater goers the penance of reinforcing their own stereotypes than actually finding the most interesting intellectual, exciting voices from those communities. Now, like I said, I don't 100% agree with that, but I will tell you, you know, everybody wants a play for me about sad refugees and everybody wants a, a play about poor black people in the ghetto. Do you know what I mean? Like, and so we can go feel sad about how hard their life is and feel like we've done our penance. So, so if, if the theaters are asking me for that play, then and you know commissioning me to you know what I mean like you look at me and you're like oh this is the girl to write about you know honor <laughs> like you know what I mean like that and I had nothing going on in America I had a lot going on in Europe so I took it and I said let me try to humanize this story let me try with everything I've got to tell an honor killing story and I just couldn't do it you know I couldn't create it it, it was not it was so false it was like a, a you know, a green banana flying and knocking the girl over on the head. It was so strange that this completely human complex father would do that to his daughter. It just it made no sense because I couldn't do it. And I, and I, and I know that if I was capable of simplifying my work and presenting that kind of story, I would have a, in the way American theater is structured now, that would be a very easy Betty Shamia play to stuff. That would be the kind of play that would be produced all over regionally and and you know what i mean garner uh, uh you know a lot of awards and kind of get that that juice going that when you when you talk about arab on arab violence that you get because it, it lets the audience off the hook it lets you know white feminism off the hook it lets uh you know about our own participation in our own othering and that's you know, something that's, that, you know, is really important for me as an American based here, creating work that I want to have a life and be part of the cultural conversation here. It's very important to me that I complicate through comedy, um, what is possible and what is said about the, how women worldwide are connected and, and that, that it's, it's so much easier to feel better, you know, about yourself if you think you've got it better than someone else. And if I tell you a story about a woman in Africa who ran you know, superpower for 20 years and we can't get one woman who was a secretary of state and married to the most powerful man in the world for eight years to be president. That kind of shows you where world feminism is and was in a way that I don't think it's talked about in theater or any sphere because it's, uh, because it doesn't reinforce, like that black writer said, that kind of simplistic narrative where people are comfortable and um, uh, where I think audiences are ready to go, but I'm not sure that um, the tastemakers of our American theater have been helping us get there. Mm. It's true when you look at the uh, early work of A.J. Kennedy, the Negro Fun House, or she talks yes. to people from Ohio State, yes. genius place where you say, why the hell is that not everywhere? Why didn't she get all the opportunities in the world? But it uh, it didn't work, and uh, and uh, she truly is a 
is a master. And I think also it's true. I mean, even so, I shouldn't do not know enough about it. I should know more, but I also do think there is a problem, perhaps also in Europe, and I don't know enough about America, but that the white feminist movement says, I'll speak for all the women in the world, the African women, I speak for the Arab women. And, but it's a white movement also, you know, they claim uh, to yes. uh, uh, think their thoughts and, uh, and uh, uh, to have an already formed opinion and perhaps without fully including them or, um, or saying, as some, a friend of mine said, you know, in Paris, you know, they would go to the airports of him, it is the white uh, liberals, but you know, the woman who cleans by, by or was, they would notice them, <laughs> talk to them. Yeah. So, um, because they Absolutely. are Arab or African or something, you know, that there's a, a disconnect. And it's also part, part of that. And to break that is, I think, the idea of theater. How do you see, how is the American, Arab American theater community ex experiencing this moment? Um, Karidat said, she thinks there are very few small places that produce her work. They will, a lot of them will close, they won't survive. She says maybe people will have to go back and build uh, little bandwagons and go through the countryside uh, to say it's better than nothing. But she had uh, not uh, so much hope. She's um, wow. tension uh, in a way yeah. of, uh, existing places. How, how, how is it, what do you think? Um, well, I, you know, very early on, I had like kind of a pan people of color experience. So I can speak more broadly. Uh, you know, I don't, I think we have to do more institution building to get at the level where, where the African American and the um, Asian American community with Mai Yi and Classical Theater of Harlem, you know, like these are actual, you know, and I can speak more broadly to New York because that's kind of my artistic home. But yeah, we need to build institutions and, and, and when you do that, you need people who are willing to hire or step down as artists to kind of do that full time. And, you know, because I'm not able to do that, I, it's hard for me to speak to what, you know, the people who are trying to create those institutions can do. Um, but, you know, we are, we are new, you know, as a community in terms of, you know, uh, in terms of uh, our, our identity, you know, we are, uh, you know, we're also like the Latino American community. Some of us look white, some of us look black, some of us look in between. Some of us identify as people of color, some of us don't, you know, um, we're different religions, you know, uh, we're, you know, there's 22 Arab countries and, and then we're also talking about, uh, you know, other identities. So it's like, are we Arab, are we Middle Eastern? You know, uh, the politics of, you know, what does Middle Eastern mean? Who gets to be included? So I, I, I can't speak directly too much, but I have a lot of hope because I, I feel there's a lot of energy and excitement around supporting people of color in general. And I think that that can only help and uplift all people of color who are, who are working, you know, but, you know, to me, there's, there's, you know, the debt that is owed to the black American community for, in theater, but in any industry for, you know, basically integrating white institutions um, has made all of our, our journeys a lot easier. Um, and so uh, for me, it's very important that people have got, you know, I, I attended something at TCG that was, you know, and, and, you know, it was people of color and we said, why don't we create theater together? Of course, it's a lot easier to go to Arab people and say, let's fund Arab American plays and, you know, Asian theaters, let's fund Asian, African American, let's fund Asian. Why don't we all do that together? But I think it's hard because there's, everybody has such a great need. And, you know, and for me, it comes down to how are these theaters funded? You know, I, uh, how, how do we fund theater? How, how do we agitate for resources, because that is, you know, the, I see, we see you white American theater, it, you know, like I said, you know, if you wanna make plays about pink elephants, do it, but don't say that you're doing diverse works. And so how we as people of color, whether we are cohesive or whether we're all in our own separate boxes, you know, I vote for we be cohesive. I think we're stronger together. And I think that's how we can build stronger institutions. Um, but it is much more difficult to fundraise that way. It's also di different, difficult to audience build that way. 
impact. You know what I mean? Like if you're going to go to an Arab American community and say, you know, uh, it's a lot easier to say, come buy, buy these three Arab American plays and come buy these three plays by people of color and which one is an Arab American writer. So that's, that's our own work that we have to do. Um, and, you know, it, it, and I, I have heard from, you know, a lot of white allies that like, they feel like this movement is happening at a time when theater is particularly vulnerable, you know, that, that, you know, that they feel that this is kind of, you know, and, and a movement happens when it happens. Uh, and I think there, there are ways to think outside the box. I mean, what I think about that is, is many of those institutions were on their last legs anyway. So if we're going to be rebuilding, let's rebuild a different kind of model and maybe that could be more cohesive maybe that could you know it's not about just integrating white institutions it's about getting funding into the hands of the people who are already doing the work that um and it's about you know finding the people in the community who really want to do the institution building which is a whole separate job than being an artist who who makes work and then has a theater company so it uh uh which is more my bent um, because I don't have uh, I don't have the desire to build an institution. I don't have that skill set or mm -hmm. that desire to be to do that. But I would hope that we could work as cohesively, not in our separate little boxes. And, and mm -hmm. but I don't see that happening soon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a big question. It's actually yes. joint space. Uh, I'm not fully aware of there is in New York City in that big city is there's a space that's dedicated to Arab American theater just one. Uh, no, there's not. The, uh, 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 be I, Silk not Road, that I small space. There's in the, Silk Road. Uh, there's Noor Theater Company that was in residence at New York Theater Workshop. Uh, there's yeah, there's there's different inst institutions uh, that are symbolically represents the significance of it and. Uh, I know even the Great Play Company, one of the few companies that is dedicated to plays from around the world, they don't have a space, they can't afford it. They are lucky if they find a partner who produces a play that is of significance, you know, that is an international play, and which we do need also to hear from. And, Absolutely. And it's Absolutely. so hard, will not, uh, yeah. nobody will, will fund it often. It has to be American, it has to be young American. And, uh, yes, and of yes. Course, and it is uh, uh, then reinforcing existing uh, models instead of saying, if it's already been done, you know about it, why would, should we do it? You know, it took something new and different and perhaps this time uh, will give us a bit more urgency to do it. From your talks, uh, when you, how, how many artists did you talk to? Can you maybe give us, what's the, what's the mood uh, of the artists you talk to? What, what do people say? Well, I mean, we're conversing more on social media than actually, um, mm -hmm you know, in real life and, and, you know, those are all always in soundbite. And, um, but, uh, you know, I think, you know, there's a, <laughs> there's a, there's a people who are like, burn it down, burn it down, <laughs> you know, be burnt, you know, and, you know, I, I think theater has to make a fundamental shift and, you know, most people aren't going to like what I have to say about that, but I think we are, you know, uh, <laughs> some guy who I was interested in told me theater is going to go the way of opera and I dumped him because I was like that's terrible but <laughs> 10 years later I'm like you know I, I think that you know we the way we're operating has been on its last legs for a long time and you know either we have to be able to make it cheap and dirty you know and and or share spaces or learn how to audience build. And I think the way to do that is to do the kinds of plays that you can only, the all kinds of experiences you can only get in theater. Like I did, the, the last play I did in New York was The Strangest, which is um, uh, from the perspective of the mother of the murder victim and uh, Albert Camus, The Stranger, kind of it's her story. And she tells it in an Arab storytelling cafe. So I invited audiences in to experience kind of the oral tradition, the thousand and one nights tradition where you have one storyteller mm -hmm. drinking coffee and hearing this story and being immersed in it. And I kind of, because it's about French Algiers, I have traditional Western form mixed with traditional Arab oral storytelling traditions. So kind of in the way that that was a hybrid culture, I created a hybrid play to tell a story about that era. Um, 
And that was very exciting for people to be able to like enter into an Arab storytelling cafe, you know, and, you know, we could only do 16 performances because um, uh, we were an equity showcase contract. But I think we have to start thinking in more interesting ways. And I'm not, I'm not, you know, not everything has to be like, you know, immersive or different, but I think there's room for us to evolve, you know, uh, and that's why, you know, classical theater of Harlem doing classical plays, in, you know, in open air stadiums in the way that they did in Athens is it's so exciting to me. I mean, people, people go out for that stuff, you know, and so, you know, are we going to look at little family dramas like we're in the era of, you know, Tennessee Williams? No, we're, we have to continue to evolve. And, you know, I just have so much empathy for everyone who is we are all trying to survive right now. Just survive, like not get this damn COVID-19 and not be thrown out of our homes and not, you know, so so I have such empathy for people from any background who have dedicated their lives to trying to make uh, theater their, their way of being in the world. So I, I hope we can all together figure out how we are going to survive as because I firmly believe this too, as somebody who has worked in so many different cultural contexts and with so many different kinds of artists, I have more in common with a playwright from any culture than I do from an American who is not interested in words. And so that, that how we think of ourselves, you know, I would really hope that we could think of ourselves as theater artists first. And, and not as white theater artists, and, you know what I mean? Who want to hold on to our power, you know, or black theater artists or Arab theater artists. I would love for us to make our own subset of a community of these weirdos who believe in like setting lights up and pretending things are real and investing our lives in making basically plays, which are, you know, when you have a kid, you realize how similar theater is to playing. It, that's what we're doing. We're adults. We have responsibilities, but we have decided that we're going to, you know, spend our lives and our, our, our emotions and our life energy and our careers playing and that we're, we're wonderfully weird creatures. And, you know, and as long as everybody gets to play on an equal playing field or does the thing they're saying they're doing with the money that they're getting to do it you know, let's go back to being that weird subculture that we are that makes room for stories that we can't hear in any other way. Um, so well, that's, uh, that's incredibly beautifully said and uh, thanks. it's true. And, um, and it's also a vision, uh, I think, that uh, we, we all can, uh, you know, just put our names under and I think this is, a hope that this uh, this crisis. I mean, Carl Hancock Wax yesterday said, you know, we don't change personally if institutions don't change. What have all these people died for? COVID that put us in such existential trouble. And he says, if we, so as you said, we don't know if we will survive. And it's really true. And and even mankind itself somehow is that saying, what if there is no vi vaccination? Yeah. It looks like people who are infected get it again and get it more severe than the first time. So um, it could very well be. And um, so um, this, this is a small serious time. And, uh, and uh, so we have to find better forms. We have to find better ways of living as we all see the American form of the health insurance, not having a nationalized uh, satellite health insurance is a terrible system. It doesn't work. Everybody knew it before, but now like an x-ray, it's clear. And perhaps also, as you point out, something was already deeply wrong in the theater where artists perhaps are not uh, part of the artistic decision that money goes to institutions. It's run often by people who study business administration or other, <clears throat> but artists, and it's important, but they should be on the table, you know, in the boardrooms, it should be shared, you know, something to say. And that's, that's the moment um, perhaps isn't, uh, is not fully there. So there is a lot to, to, to be done. And I think your work um, is inspiring and also I think your idea to say perhaps a comet uh, uh, will be uh, something of significance. Hannah Muller said I can only write my tragedies in, in, in 
in the dictatorial uh, uh, societies, you know, you need. So uh, your idea that he said comedy is for your democracies and uh, <laughs> understand what we're doing. So it's a hopeful thing that you say we perhaps move into a way where this is the most significant, perhaps also ridiculousness represents the real world much better. That is farcical, that our leaders are not, Trump is not a tragic leader, you know, as she pointed out, it's a farce, you know, and it's, it's disrespectful um, to the people he is sworn to serve. So we have to be um, part of that change. And so it's important that what you do, we are coming to the end and of course we could talk so much more. And um, and by the way, listening to you, I would say maybe the classical theater of Harlem should be the Renaissance theater of Harlem, you know, listening that you are doing your project now, you know, and uh, and it might be um, a name that also uh, gives uh, hope and connects and to, to have a rebirth um, of something. And, um, and uh, Hans C. Lehmann said, and I always quote it, he said, theater is a big house and it has many rooms. And there are rooms for the revival of a Tennessee William play of the great mm -hmm. place of the new group, the, mm -hmm. the 18th, 17th century plays. But there's also a place for new communities on you. And perhaps, as you said, perhaps it will define this era more. Of course, we do need, like in the museum, see, hear, experience messages from different times and reevaluate them. And, um, but what is missing at the moment is spaces for um, uh, artists who are part of that complex uh, community structure or society we all live in and they are not represented as they should be. There's a lot of space, to, but we need to hear these stories as someone said who was on the last year from the Caribbean and, uh, that uh, you know, if we don't tell the stories, we, we are sick and if we don't hear the stories we need to hear. We, are so it's part of healing, and uh, and I think uh, uh, what you did and what you are on to discover is of significance and importance. And greater the classical theater of Harlem to give you a space for the melon to support you, for people to come, for your family to give you a space. I can only imagine how complicated it is that in a way you are isolated, but you're not alone. You don't have solitude with this difference between the loneliness and solitude but the solitude as a writer you don't have even if you are you know because you now you're isolated but you don't have that so it's a very hard place to be and um but um as, uh, as someone said i think it was Thiago rodriguez from portugal said perhaps we have to also live this moment and experience it there might not be answers and postpone it and this or that what make us say but we have to be uh live the complication at the moment and um and this is a way to, to deal with it. So um, as the last uh, question we often do ask, what do you say to the, what would you say to the young Betty Shamia who's <laughs> starting out? Uh, what do you say to young artists? Oh, what should people oh do? Oh my God. What is Frank, I, I always ask that question and I yeah. don't even have a good answer. Uh, uh -huh. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's good, you know, so. you know I, I always ask that because I'm interviewing people too, but, um, uh, I think that I would say is that um, it never gets easier, but you can make it more fun. You can laugh, you know, with your full self and, and really enjoy uh, and give yourself the opportunity while you're alive to be alive. It's not about, uh, you know, you don't have a responsibility to change the world until you can change you, yourself and your belief that you can change the world, you know? And, and I just would say, I would, I would tell people to have a better time. You know, I would tell people if you're alone and reading books, enjoy those books. If you're in the middle of three generations of your family, enjoy that family. Just really, and moment by moment, really just take in where you're at. And because we aren't here forever. And this is, you know, uh, I think Jeanette Winchison said, um, you know, the, well, salmon don't question the stream. This is where we are. This is where we have to go. And we can't be like, oh, I wish I was on that stream or this stream or this stream is harder. And I, you know, this one has rocks and I'm, you know what I mean? Like tired, you know, this, we just, that's our, our kind of imperative as people, which is to keep swimming along in whatever streams we find ourselves in. And um, uh, and just to have a better time, I think that I, I one of the things 
you know, now that I do have a home, now that I'm back working in America, which was for a long time, incredibly frustrating um, for me, particularly given, you know, that everyone was saying that they were doing diverse works. And I was one of the leading Arab American artists uh, in a post 9-11 era. And my stuff was being taught at universities, but I could not be part of the cultural conversation. Is like, you will find your home, uh, but you won't find it until uh, you know you got to be calm to look. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. what it is. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank that's, you. That's, that's important, really. Thank you. Thank you. I also would like to um, mention the Siegel Center next to uh, European stages and the Journal of American Drama and Theater. We publish our up stages since four or five years. Marvin Carlson, the great Marvin Carlson, yeah. created it. I helped it um, to, to get it in where we review and, you know, and uh, theater work is about uh, productions all around from the diaspora but also in the Arab countries. Siegel Center is, even so it's only 12 or 13 books, but no one has published more Arab plays and translations than we did, which is stunning. Nope. We are the leading. Um, so there is a significance of it and we have something to, to, to learn from it. It makes us richer. It's uh, like world music. Every great musician listens to music from everywhere in the world to become a better musician to learn something he hasn't seen or heard and to incorporate it or to know what kind of musician she or he really is. And the same has and should be with theater. And, um, and uh, your work, um, of course, also you know, uh, contributes to that. that work I too. just have to acknowledge you and uh, yeah. you and Marvin and the work that you guys have done. I have spent a good portion of my 20s sitting at the wonderful talks and the wonderful work that you do. And it really has fed me as an artist. It's kept me excited and motivated to be part of an international conversation. And I just, I am one of your biggest fans. I think what you guys do at the Siegel Center is incredible and so important and fun, fun, and really so, fun. <laughs> joy, that is joy is a signif of significance. You know, I think mm -hmm. that this is a, the uh, a joyful participation in the sorrows of life. This is what we yes. should be doing and joyful. And uh, thanks for, for reminding us. So thank you all. Um, and for listening, and this I think was another I think uh, important and uh, and 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 uh, uh, illuminating a conversation. What that he has to say is of significance uh, for all of us, but also for especially for people in the theater. But how she thinks about life and what she detects and how she um, uh, puts it into a form and creates meaning. We don't have the structures of religion or dictatorial. Uh, governments hopefully I, you know we have to make our own minds now and we have to connect it and switch it and that's okay too it's hard but i think theater can can help uh, tomorrow um, um we will um continue um here um uh, on our siegel talks and um we will have adelheid rosen from amsterdam and she will talk uh, with uh, melanie joseph about uh, her work uh, socially strongly engaged work with communities uh, in uh, in, uh, in Amsterdam as a theater artist on the fringes, he has become by Vogue was mentioned, uh, was declared Women of the Year in our, we didn't know that when that came in. So uh, that will be of interest uh, to hear what um, she uh, what um, she is doing. And um, and Melanie, of course, uh, uh, be a great partner to talk to next Monday, we, which will be the last week of the Siegel Talk after four months, we did every day. From Monday to Friday, we had a theater wow. artist. But last week, the next one, we have the great French philosopher Jacques Concierge. He will talk about uh, how well, he experiences this moment and how he feels and what it means uh, to him. The great Morgan Jeunesse, the dramaturg, supporter, agent, will, who is so connected to the New York community, will share um, her, her thoughts uh, with this. Uh, Heli Minardi from Indonesia, performance artist, uh, will talk about her work, the organizations and the art network she is creating and how that matters uh, to what we have here. Um, Thursday, we will have one or two artists uh, from Lebanon. It's not completely clear who it will be, but uh, uh, we will announce soon. And Friday is kind of a closing. Richard Schachner will come back and talk about theater performance and also perhaps lead us a little bit to the uh, upcoming TDR edition. Um, we also at Good News, PHA, the uh, Journal for Performance and Art, will, ex will publish 30 excerpts from our conversation in the upcoming uh, Performing Arts Journal edition, and they're doing it very fast. It will go to print next week, so 
people will have access to it, students, whoever teachers can perhaps also find this out just on MIT Press. It might even be publicly available, we don't know yet. So um, thank you, Betty, for really contributing. Thanks for our audience for listening. And it's important for Betty uh, that she knows that you care, that we listen to her. As she said, she was part of that conversation, but I didn't feel uh, she was in the center of it. And I hope this also uh, puts you a bit more um, into it. And uh, it can be something in there that is of significance for our lives. Thanks to HowlRound for hosting us and the Siegel team. So um, see you all hopefully uh, tomorrow and uh, next week and Betty again. Thank you so, so much. And uh, it was a very, very uh, significant what you said and uh, it's something a lot to, to think about. Bye bye Thank and you. good luck. Bye. And Thank you. Writing you all my best to your family and that you all stay safe together. It's a big, big, big challenge and that we all get through this. Thank